According to the 9-11 Commission, the airplane that appeared over Washington and went on to strike the Pentagon was Flight American 77, the same plane that had disappeared from radar screens over West Virginia almost one hour before. But they never provided any evidence of that. As we have seen, the flight data recorder's serial number that could have identified the airplane was never released. All the debunkers have to show for Flight 77 is a small piece of wreckage carrying an American Airlines serial number. But this piece could have been placed by anyone onto the grass after the impact. In fact, unidentified men in suits were seen meddling with the debris right after the impact in direct violation of the rules of a crime scene. A contractor who was only 100 yards away from the point of impact stated, it was DPS, the guys in the black coats. They were here right then and there. That's what I don't understand. Where did they come from? Maybe they knew something. I don't know. The debunkers claim that the witnesses' accounts are more than sufficient to identify the airplanes. Hundreds of people saw an American Airlines jet fly into that building. But it's presumable that if anyone wanted a different airplane to look like an American Airlines aircraft, they would have at least thought of painting the fuselage with the same colors. The majority of witnesses recall seeing a large airliner, but there are also witnesses who describe a much smaller, executive-like airplane. I was just casually looking out the corner, out, out of the window, and in the corner of my eye I saw what looked to be um, maybe a 20-passenger corporate jet, no markings on the side. Uh, from my office, I was able to see um, a white jet, like a Gulfstream-type commuter jet, I, I guess. Omar, you say this was a smaller plane, uh, 10 to 15 passengers, maybe? No, it's muy grande. No, it's muy grande. They say it's not like too big, it's just... Uh, need, uh, to say los aviones comerciales. Uh, they say like it's like a uh, business uh, aeroplane. Like a business jet. Yeah. It looked like a commuter plane, two engines come down from the south, real low, uh, proceed right on and crash right into the uh, Pentagon. And are you fairly sure that it was what we sometimes describe and recognize as a yes, small I commuter did. plane? Uh, yes, it was. By the witnesses' accounts alone, Alone, it's impossible to establish what kind of airplane it was. As the plane clipped five light poles before striking the Pentagon, the debunkers maintain that the distance between the light poles indicates a corridor wide enough that only a large airliner could have created it. Ce qu'on peut voir justement, c'est que l'avion en arrivant a tombé cinq pylônes qui étaient sur son sur sa trajectoire, et ces ces pylônes étaient espacés de 25 mètres. Troviamo alcuni lampioni abbattuti. Cinque lampioni, tutti insieme fanno una fascia larga 26 metri. Facciamo finta di ipotizzare che non sappiamo che si tratti di un aereo. Sappiamo che c'è qualche cosa largo 26 metri che è passato di lì. 26 meters is roughly 85 feet. But the wingspan of a 757 is 124 feet, which means any airplane with an 85 foot wingspan could have downed those light poles. It didn't need to be a 757. In fact, with a 100-ton airliner hitting a reinforced concrete building like the Pentagon, one would expect to find a situation similar to this. What immediately stood out instead was the absence of large, identifiable pieces of debris which are usually found after the crash of an airliner. Bob Pugh was the first Maybe professional cinematographer to arrive on site. Uh, no one was in control of the area. Um, I had free reign. Um, and there's a lot of debris in the foreground of those videos. Again, it's very small pieces. I mean, I'm standing on pieces, a dinner plate or smaller in size. All the while, I'm looking for wreckage. Um, and I can't find a piece of anything that I recognize. I can't see the tail. I can't see the wheels. I can't see the engines. There's no chairs. There's no luggage. According to the debunkers, there are no large pieces of debris on the lawn because most of the airplane ended up inside the building. Quindi, gran parte dei frammenti dell'aereo non sono fuori perché l'aereo è entrato nell'edificio. Purdue University has produced a detailed computer animation illustrating the official version of the event. We had the plans for the Pentagon, all the details, right down to the last reinforcing bar. Uh, the speed of the airplane and the direction from which came was given to us by the uh, Transport Safety Institute. According to the official version, the plane approached in a low trajectory, clipping five light poles from the nearby intersection. Slightly tilted to the left, it hit a trailer parked outside the building with the bottom of the right wing, and then impacted the facade at an angle of 42 degrees. Most of the plane penetrated the facade and proceeded inside the building on a diagonal course, causing destruction as it was being destroyed. 
The fuselage pierced through the outer wall of the sea ring, producing this round-shaped exit hole 10 to 12 feet wide. There are, however, many problems with this version of the events. The first one is the actual wingspan of a Boeing 757. Most of us remember the facade of the Pentagon after it had collapsed. But before it collapsed, right after the impact, this is what the building looked like. This series of pictures was taken by a Navy photographer shortly after the impact. There doesn't seem to be enough damage for a Boeing 757 to have penetrated the building almost in full. Using the best part from each image, a digital expert has created this composite picture, which has become the universal tool of reference for anyone involved in the debate. The composite picture shows an almost continuous opening at ground level, about 90 feet wide. The damage extends to the second floor, with an entry hole about 15 feet wide. This is enough, maintain the debunkers, to have accommodated most of the plane inside the building. Effectivement, on peut se demander où est-il passé. Et puis, si on prend des photos qui ont été prises à des instants différents et qui, justement, par un assemblage, ont permis de montrer les dégâts qui étaient réellement euh, visibles sur la façade, et là, on voit clairement que tout, tout le rez-de-chaussée a été anéanti sur, sur une longueur de 30 mètres. Mm. Et puis, euh, au milieu, bien sûr, vous avez le trou de la carlingue. Mm. That gash in the E-ring was about 90 feet across. The, um, the wingspan of the plane was about 124 and change. That punched the hole into the building. It is true, the wingspan of a 757 is 124 feet, but the debunkers forget that the plane came in at a 42 degree angle, which makes the projected wingspan on the facade 160 feet wide. That's almost twice the 90 foot existing gash. As shown in this animation, the left wing should have also destroyed these two windows to the left of the opening. But the whole segment to the left of the opening doesn't seem to have been hit by a wing traveling at 500 miles per hour. The window's wooden frames are still in place, and the glass seems to have been broken from the ensuing explosion, not from the impact itself. The limestone covering the facade has fallen off, but the bricks underneath appear practically untouched. By the same projected angle, the right wing should have impacted the facade all the way to this column on the second floor. In fact, there is a diagonal cut on the second floor wall that could have resulted from the wing's impact. But this puts most of the wing above the second floor slab, which means it never penetrated the facade to begin with. So where did it go? This is the explanation by popular mechanics for what happened to the wings. The wings did not fully penetrate the facade. In fact, the wings had already been partially sheared off by the time the plane even hit the building. The fuselage mainly made the hole that existed. Conspiracy theorists want to know why it wasn't the width of the full wingspan of the plane, and actually just the simple reason was that the wings came off. But where did they go? Popular mechanics doesn't say. A similar problem is posed by the horizontal stabilizers, which extend some 50 feet in width. As they are mounted three feet higher than the wings, they should have impacted the facade approximately here and here. But there are no visible marks from their impact on the facade, nor is any recognizable piece of the stabilizers visible on the lawn. Same story for the tail, which raises 24 feet above the fuselage. At the time of impact, the tail should have hit as high as the windows on the fourth floor. The Purdue animation shows the tail entering the building in full, as if it were cutting through butter. But the facade above the entry hole doesn't show any significant damage, and the glass from the windows around the hole isn't even broken. For the missing tail and stabilizers, Popular Mechanics offers this generic explanation. A uh, plane flying 500 miles an hour hitting a concrete wall that is extremely reinforced, there's not going to be much left of it. You're not going to see it sitting on the lawn of the Pentagon in one or two or three pieces. But here is the problem. If part of the wings, the stabilizers, and the tail disintegrated in a thousand pieces against the facade, how could the fuselage penetrate it almost entirely? The fuselage is by far the weakest part of the plane, as it basically consists of an empty cylinder meant to carry the passengers and their belongings. How fragile the fuselage is, compared to the wings, is explained by aviation expert Jacques Roland. Jacques Roland, ancien général de l'armée de l'air, est aujourd'hui le meilleur expert en crash aérien auprès des tribunaux. Il n'est pas du tout évident de comprendre qu'effectivement, dès que vous avez un choc à l'avant, l'ensemble s'enfonce à la vitesse de pénétration, en fait. Et le premier point dur se trouve ici. Tant que vous n'arrivez pas là, euh, l'avion, euh, c'est du papier. Question. 
How could the fuselage, which is the weakest part of the plane, penetrate the facade almost entirely, while part of the wings, the stabilizers, and the tail, which are relatively stronger, were unable to do so and were shattered in a thousand pieces instead? Even more mysterious is the disappearance of the engines. The 757 that allegedly hit the Pentagon was equipped with two RB211 engines built by Rolls-Royce. Almost eight feet in height, weighing over 7,000 pounds each, the internal core of the engine is made with components so sturdy and resistant that they are considered practically indestructible. It has a rotator at 10,000 revolutions per minute, the blade speed of about 800 miles per hour. The component itself operates at something like 300 degrees above the melting point of the alloy. To operate at around 1,700 degrees, they're designed not to melt. Quali sono le parti che non vengono distrutte, che non si squagliano per il calore? I pezzi del carrello e il, e il cuore dei due motori, che è molto più compatto dalla parte esterna dei motori, ovviamente fatto in materiali eh, resi, che devono resistere alla temperatura, 2000-2500 gradi, per cui la parte centrale dei due motori è sicuramente sopravvissuta all'impatto. Ma dove sono? In their animation, Purdue University has chosen to ignore the issue. As one can see, moments before the impact, the two engines simply vanish into thin air. Debunker Paolo Attivissimo has made what he calls a cautious suggestion. This is a motor, Rolls-Royce RB211. This is an object found in front the Pentagon. When I said earlier, probably the motors are not completely entered. This object is compatible with the form. I'm prudent. I say simply that it's compatible with the form. But this rotor could have come from any engine. There is also another picture of a similar disc, or possibly the same disc, from a different angle. And then there is this part of an engine found inside the Pentagon. But we are not looking for scraps. We are looking for two three-ton pieces of machinery made with steel and titanium that after an accident should look something like this. Or like this. Or like this. In fact, had the Pentagon been hit by a 757, the two engines would have impacted the facade around these two points, just below the wings. This means they would have proceeded inside the building on a path somewhat parallel to the fuselage, carving a trail of destruction much more devastating than any other part of the plane. È un proiettile simile al motore? Sì, sì, sicuramente sì. Può essere tranquillamente un proiettile. Lanciato quello a 800 km all'ora, la struttura viaggia. But there are no engines visible outside the exit hole, nor are there any other holes in the wall that could have been caused by an engine. Question, can you explain what happened to the core of the two engines, which is built with components so strong and resistant to be considered practically indestructible? Now for the biggest mystery of all, the exit hole. According to the official version, it was the fuselage of the plane that created this hole in the wall of the C-ring. On September 15, 2001, the Pentagon renovation manager stated, the plane penetrated through the E-ring, D-ring, C-ring. The nose of the plane just barely broke through the inside of the C-ring, so it was extending into AE drive a little bit. The AE drive is the internal alley separating the C-ring from the B-ring. But how could the fuselage have made it all the way through the wall of the C-ring? Un aereo che pesa 120 tonnellate, lanciato 800 km l'ora, impatta una facciata, la trapassa. Nel trapassarla viene tritato dalle colonne che ci sono in mezzo, a mo' di grattugia, se volete mi passate questo termine, e alla fine quel che rimane sono solo frammenti molto piccoli. Quel poco che rimane in fondo arriva dall'altra parte. If the fuselage is only a cylinder and it gets cut and ground by the columns in a thousand pieces, how can it retain the circular shape needed to punch this almost perfectly round hole in the wall? This is where the explanations by the debunkers become absolutely fascinating. The mass of the plane penetrated the building with enormous energy and continued into the building in a state almost more like a liquid than a solid. Then encountered reinforced concrete columns two feet thick so the aircraft was flying through a forest of columns. The plane became almost like an artillery shell or a tank round. What actually came out it was a circular ball of fire, which is how fire goes when it moves. That's why it has a perfectly round shape. By this time, 
There was an avalanche of debris that was moving as a single mass, much as in an avalanche of snow. Whether it was a liquid mass, a ball of fire, or an avalanche of snow, all these hypotheses are flatly contradicted by the Pentagon Building Performance Report, a document published in 2003 by the American Society of Civil Engineers. In assessing the condition of the columns on the first floor, the report reads, Columns 3G, 3H, 3J, and 5J were damaged but still standing, although in the direct path of the fuselage. It is highly unlikely that any significant portion of the fuselage could have retained structural integrity at this point in its travel. The aircraft frame most certainly was destroyed before it had traveled a distance that approximately equaled the length of the aircraft. The length of the aircraft is 155 feet, which is roughly half the distance between the entry and the exit holes. That no substantial part of the fuselage reached the wall of the sea ring was also confirmed by the first eyewitnesses who described the damage inside the Pentagon. So the plane went in up to the E, D, and to the C ring, not all the way through the C ring. Furthermore, if we follow the lines connecting the exit hole to the impact zone at the angle of 42 degrees, we see that the path is repeatedly blocked at some point or another by columns that are damaged but still standing. This means that no substantial piece of debris could have traveled from the impact zone to the exit hole in any case. Question. Given that, according to the Pentagon Building Performance Report, the aircraft frame most certainly was destroyed before it had traveled a distance that approximately equaled the length of the aircraft, and that it is highly unlikely that any significant portion of the fuselage could have retained structural integrity from that point on, can you explain what caused the almost perfectly round exit hole in the outer wall of the sea ring in conclusion, we have an opening on the first floor that's a bit more than half the projected wingspan of a 757. The tip of the left wing and most of the right wing missing without a valid explanation. The horizontal stabilizers and the tail also missing without a valid explanation. A fuselage that behaved more like a warhead than an empty cylinder made with aluminum. No trace whatsoever of the core of the two engines and an exit hole on the C-ring that no one can rationally explain. Given all these facts, we must conclude that the damage observed at the Pentagon is not compatible with and must have been created by something other than a Boeing 757. The mystery of what hit the Pentagon could have been easily solved if the FBI had released the videos from dozens of surveillance cameras that are placed all around the impact zone. Yeah, there were a lot of cameras around the Pentagon. If you look at the Pentagon, you can see that there's cameras on each corner. There's cameras at some of the businesses around the Pentagon. And we know in those cases, the tapes were confiscated immediately by the FBI within hours of the event. When a Freedom of Information Act requesting all the videos covering the impact zone was filed, the FBI agent in charge of the tapes responded, the FBI possessed 85 videotapes that might be potentially responsive to plaintiff's FOIA request. But, concluded the agent, I determined that only one videotape showed the impact of Flight 77 into the Pentagon on September 11, 2001. This is the tape we have all seen many, many times. The FBI could have released all the videos anyway, just to allow the public to see by themselves what was actually shown in each of them. But for some reason, they preferred to keep them under wraps. I've uh, filmed before down at the Pentagon, before 9-11. There's got to be at least 100 video cameras ringing that building, in the trees, everywhere. They've got that plane coming in, in a, at a, with 100 angles. I want to see the video. I want to see 100 videos that exist of this. Why don't they want us to see that plane coming into the building? Not only has this question never been answered, but an in-depth analysis of the only footage of the impact ever released contains a dramatic surprise. Initially, the DOD released these five frames taken from a Pentagon parking security camera. Later on, in 2006, the DOD released the entire sequence from which the five frames had been extracted. The time-lapse sequence runs at approximately one frame per second, and it shows the moments leading up to the impact, the large explosion, and the billowing fire that ensued. Unfortunately, the video does not show the airplane in transit. All we can see in the frame preceding the explosion is what appears to be the tail of an airplane followed by a trail of white smoke. But the body of the plane remains covered by this concrete column standing in the foreground. 
The Department of Defense also released a second video taken by a different camera from the same parking lot. The second camera was actually located in the very column that obscured the view of the plane in the first video. This aerial shot of the Pentagon shows the actual location of the two cameras. The second camera faces in the same direction as the first, and it offers a clear, unobstructed view of the same field of action. By using the moment of the explosion, we can synchronize the two cameras with absolute frame-by-frame -frame accuracy. By synchronizing the two cameras, we notice that the second video begins earlier than the first, while the first lasts longer than the second. This leaves us with a middle, common section of about 100 frames, which are perfectly synchronized with each other. From the moment the police car moves on, the action proceeds in an identical manner both in the frames preceding the explosion and in those following the explosion. Especially in the second part of the videos, after the explosion, we can verify how each couple of frames depicts exactly the same action by looking at the shape of the billowing smoke. This confirms that the two cameras were operating in perfect synchronization. This is only to be expected. After all, the two cameras were controlled by a centralized recording system called Multiplexer, or TLR. There is, however, one pair of frames from the two videos that shows a completely different action from one another. They happen to be the two frames in which the plane travels across the lawn. It's frame 23 in the relative count. As the first video showed the tail and the trail of smoke, we would expect the second camera placed in this concrete column to show the entire body of the plane in the same position. It does not. In the corresponding frame, camera two shows only the tip of the plane entering frame from the right-hand corner. But how can the nose of the plane be behind the tail at the same moment in time? The synchronization system allows for a maximum fluctuation between the two cameras, or margin of error, of 1 30th of a second. Given that the plane is traveling at 750 feet per second, the maximum possible fluctuation between the two cameras would translate into a difference of a mere 25 feet in the position of the plane. A 757 is 155 feet long. Even calculating the perspective due to the diagonal path, this is far from sufficient to explain the large discrepancy between the two images. Furthermore, after this moment, the two videos resume their perfect synchronization, which is maintained all the way to the end. Why these two crucial frames, and only these two, are so different from one another has puzzled researchers and digital experts alike. The same digital expert who had prepared the universal image from the Pentagon has also conducted an in-depth technical analysis of the two videos released by the Department of Defense. After confirming that the two cameras were synchronized by the same multiplexer system, this expert has compiled a table comparing the contents of each pair of frames. As one can see, frame 23 is the only one showing a strong inconsistency between the two images. The expert has then proceeded to analyze the two frames with the most sophisticated digital tools and has obtained some astonishing results. A series of Boolean subtractions reveals that a small part of the image is actually present in both frames. What is said to be the nose of the airplane in camera 2 is also present as part of the smoke trail in camera 1. It seems in fact as if someone has retouched this area of the frame by means of cut and paste in order to cover the plane while he has kept the end of the smoke trail to make it look like the nose of the plane entering frame. Question. Given that the maximum fluctuation between the two cameras would translate in a difference of 25 feet in the position of the plane, can you provide a valid explanation for the large discrepancy between the two corresponding frames? Absent a valid explanation for this discrepancy, we must conclude that at least one of the two frames is the result of intentional manipulation or photoshopping. If we now summarize the situation at the Pentagon, we have the total lack of evidence that the unknown incoming was in fact Flight 77, a mysterious phantom plane that attracted the attention in the opposite direction, the failure from the White House to shoot down the incoming even though it posed a serious and imminent threat, a totally illogical approach maneuver from a terrorist's point of view, an alleged hijacker incapable of performing that maneuver, the absence of any significant part of the plane from the wreckage, a damage to the building clearly incompatible with a 757, a doctored tape of the impact, 
and the obvious reluctance by the FBI to release any other tape that could allow the identification of the plane. The whole issue of Flight 93 basically boils down to one question. If you just happened to drive by and someone told you that a Boeing 757 has just crashed into this hole and most of the 100-ton airliner is now buried under the ground, would you believe it or not? This is the kind of puzzlement the people from Shanksville experienced when they arrived on the crash site of Flight 93. We drove back that road and where the road ended, that's where the plane was. And I mean, you know, I, the only thing I could tell them, you know, I get out, you know, like I said, I heard this thing, you know, I felt the explosion, saw the fireball, and, I'm, and I get up there and I'm thinking, where is it, you know? Just debris, pieces, small pieces of debris, and you know, the trees were singed and burning, it was just smoldering. Nothing, it was just little pieces. There was nothing to actually like a door or a window or anything, you couldn't really, it was just little pieces of shrapnel everywhere. So what's that right there? Over in here. TV reporters were also at a loss when faced with the idea that an actual plane had just crashed on that site. You know, at first I wasn't even sure that this was, uh, that these were pieces of the plane. They're so small um, and, and, it's, and, and it's indistinguishable. You can't tell whether it's a piece of the fuselage or a piece of the seats. You don't know what it is. Chris Kanicki, he's a photographer. He was back there just a couple of minutes ago, and Chris, I've seen the pictures. It looks like there's nothing there except for a hole in the ground. Uh, basically, that's right. From where we could see, there wasn't much left. Any large pieces of debris at all? No, there was nothing, nothing that you could distinguish that a plane had crashed there. It's really all you see is a large crater in the ground and, and just tiny, tiny bits of debris. Alert also went out to Somerset County Coroner Wallace Miller. He hurried to the scene, an abandoned strip mine. When he arrived, he couldn't believe his eyes. It looked like someone had gouged about a 10-foot wide, 10-foot deep trot through the strip mine area. But when you looked in, it was just covered with dirt. There was nothing there that you could really say was an airplane. Dennis Roddy was the editor-in-chief of the Pittsburgh Gazette. Airplane debris? Nothing I could identify. Possibly the most disconcerted of all was the mayor of Shanksville, Ernie Stuhl. My brother-in-law and a good friend. Yeah, mein Schwager und ein guter Freund von mir waren die ersten hier. They were standing in Shanksville on the corner of the street. Sie haben in Shanksville an einer Straßenecke gestanden und sich unterhalten. Was right there, and they were the first. Ihr Wagen stand gleich in der Nähe, und so waren sie die ersten hier. Dann kam erst die Feuerwehr. Alle waren wie vor den Kopf gestoßen, weil sie zu einem Flugzeugabsturz gerufen wurden. Aber da war kein Flugzeug. Kein Flugzeug. Sie wurden hier zu der Unfallstelle geschickt und da war kein Flugzeug? Nein, da war nichts. Nur dieses Loch. This is it. Das ist es, was sie sah. Ich dachte immer, das sei die Absturzstelle. Das ist sie, aber da ist nichts zu sehen. It's in that hole, says the FBI, that most of the airplane lays literally buried in the ground. Much of the plane and its contents were found beneath the soft dirt, states the FBI's website. Evidence technicians found the flight data recorder about 12 feet below the surface and the cockpit voice recorder about 25 feet deep. Since the two black boxes are located in the tail of the plane, one must conclude that also the cockpit, most of the fuselage, the passengers' seats and bodies, and their belongings somehow managed to get buried deep underground. The only ones who don't seem to have a problem with this explanation are the debunkers. We have this idea that when planes crash, they crack in half and there's this dramatic burn wreckage. That's what happens when planes crash at very low speeds, usually on approach or takeoff from an airport. This plane was flying straight down. It was approaching the speed of sound. It would have if it had gone much farther. And it penetrated into soft ground with incredible velocity. Ma qui la caduta è stata diversa. L'aereo era quasi verticale quando si è schiantato a una velocità altissima. L'aereo si schiaccia quasi nel terreno, produce un cratere piccolo e, e, e questo è quello che rimane e va a finire quasi tutto nel, nel, nel terreno. First of all, it isn't true that the plane hit the ground almost vertically. According to the NTSB flight path, the 757 hit the ground at an angle of about 45 degrees. This fact alone removes much of the exceptionality the debunkers would like to attach to this crash. But even if it were true that the plane fell almost vertically, how could the hole have closed itself up even before the first responders arrived? 
This is not mud. This is your typical hard country soil. When a plane crashes and makes a hole in the ground, the hole remains open and quite visible from above. This, for example, is the crater caused by Flight Pan Am 103 when it crashed in Lockerbie, Scotland in 1988. It's true that the 747, the plane that crashed in Lockerbie, is larger than a 757, but it's also true that the Pan Am flight broke up in mid-air due to an explosion and that only part of the plane caused the crater seen in the photographs. Let's compare the size of the Lockerbie crater, several blocks wide, with the one in Shanksville, several feet wide. This is the size of a human being next to the Lockerbie crater. This is the size of a human being next to the Shanksville crater. These are people looking down into the Lockerbie crater. These are people standing by the Shanksville crater after the accident. Compare the size of a car with the Lockerbie crater and the size of a small truck with the crater in Shanksville. This is the largest chunk of the Pan Am flight that was found near Lockerbie. It's almost half the front part of the fuselage and includes part of the cockpit. This is the largest piece of debris we have ever seen from Shanksville. It's a piece of fuselage a bit wider than two passenger windows in a picture released five years after the event. This is an engine from Pan Am Flight 103 which plunged to the ground at a location near Lockerbie. This, we are told, is an engine from Flight 93 which was supposedly excavated from the hole in Shanksville. These are images from different crashes, showing that the tail of the plane almost always survives. It does so because it's normally the last part of the plane impacting the terrain, when most of the kinetic energy has already been dissipated to the ground. This is the mark on the ground that was supposedly left by the tail of Flight 93 before it vanished into thin air. These are the chunks of the wings that are normally found after a plane crash. These are the marks that the wings of the plane allegedly left on the ground in Shanksville before vanishing with everything else into thin air. And this is the center of the hole, which is supposed to have swallowed practically the whole fuselage. But this is where the official story of the crash becomes truly fascinating. According to the FBI, after two weeks of excavation in Shanksville, 95% of the plane had been recovered. A Boeing 757 weighs roughly 100 tons. A mid-sized car weighs about 2,500 pounds, a ton and a half. This means that, according to the FBI, the equivalent of at least 50 to 60 cars was actually excavated from the ground. Question. Can you explain how most of an airplane weighing 100 tons could end up buried deep underground in a hole that closed itself up before the first responders arrived? But even if it were true that 95% of the plane has been recovered, where is it? Why have we never been shown it? When a controversial accident happens, all efforts are made to recover as many pieces of the plane as possible. These, for example, are the remains of the flight from Lockerbie, which have been pieced together in a hangar. These are the remains of TWA 800, the flight that crashed in the ocean near Long Island in July 1996. These are the remains of flight Itavia 870, which crashed in unclear circumstances near Ustica, Italy in 1980. Why wasn't the same thing done with United 93? Given the controversy on the absence of debris, coupled with the rumors of a possible shootdown, it would have been the perfect way to put all the conspiracy theories to rest. Instead, we are told, all the recovered parts of the plane have been sequestered by the FBI, and no one has ever been able to see them. As far as we know, Flight 93 might have never crashed in Shanksville to begin with. There is another problem for those who support the official version. When an airplane crashes to the ground, normally a plume of thick black smoke rises to the sky and continues to burn until all the fuel is consumed. But instead of being faced by something like that, this is what the people in Shanksville saw. This is what we saw. Uh -huh. This is das, was wir gesehen haben. Almost looks Sieht like fast aus wie ein Pilz. Yes. It looked like a mushroom cloud, he said but under the cloud there is no plume of black smoke rising to the sky, and the mushroom shape is the classic result of a bomb explosion. The same local reporter also noticed the absence of smell from burnt jet fuel and the odor of scorched earth instead. And there's a very strong odor of, a, of the scorched earth. The only way I can describe it, it doesn't smell like jet fuel, it smells like... Kendall, how do you describe it? It's burned earth. Burned earth. It smells like burned earth. The grass next to the hole also indicates there was no fire after the explosion, as it appears perfectly dry and untouched all around. 
Some have suggested that this is only the initial explosion and that the plume of black smoke hasn't started to rise yet. But this hypothesis is disproven by this video, taken by a local amateur shortly after the explosion took place. Crash over on uh, Lambertsville Road. As one can see, the initial cloud floats in the air, but the typical plume of black smoke rising from below is not there. Uh, don't know anything if we fast forward the video, we can see that the situation doesn't change much. After more than one minute, the initial cloud is still there, but there is no black smoke whatsoever rising from below. Question. Since the plane was carrying eight to 10,000 gallons of fuel at the time of impact, can you explain why there is no plume of black smoke rising from the ground after the initial explosion? But the toughest problem for the supporters of the official version is to explain how different parts of debris could end up several miles away from the crash site, even though the plane is supposed to have hit the ground in one piece. William Bunch was a reporter for the Pittsburgh Gazette. I um, gathered all the information I could and, and uh, you know, quickly learned that there were a lot of things about the crash of Flight 93 that didn't really add up right away. Um, the fact that debris fell on this lake a couple miles away at the same time that the plane was crashing. The lake Bunch is talking about is Indian Lake, which is located a couple of miles southeast of the crash site. According to the debunkers, there is a valid explanation for the debris found in the lake. First of all, it's not true that there was wind on that day. As the images show, there was only a light breeze gently moving the air all around. The very cloud from the explosion, as we have seen before, practically didn't move for over one minute. Secondly, it wasn't just small pieces of paper that were found. From the Pittsburgh Tribune, we read, by Wednesday morning, crash debris began washing ashore at the marina. Witness John Flegel said there was something that looked like a rib bone amid pieces of seats, small chunks of melted plastic, and checks. In any case, the problem is not limited to Indian Lake, which is two miles away from the crash site. Debris from the plane was found as far as eight miles away near New Baltimore. This is the map of the debris field published by the Pittsburgh Tribune. CNN also reported the secondary field, confirming that the debris belonged to Flight 93. Well, Darren, in the last hour or so, the FBI and the state police here have confirmed that they have cordoned off a second area about six to eight miles away from the crater here where this plane went down. This is apparently another debris site, which raises a number of questions. Why would debris from the plane, and they identified it specifically as being from this plane, why would debris be located six miles away? Could it have blown that far away? Seems highly unlikely. And as to whether it broke up, on the way, we don't know that. FBI is being very tight-lipped about that. But again, it leads to that possibility. It certainly leads to a number of questions. Since the plane is supposed to have hit the ground in one piece, can you explain how it was possible for debris to be found six to eight miles from the crash site on a day when only a light breeze was blowing? The extension of the debris field is not the only fact suggesting a shoot-down. There are other elements that seem to confirm it. Standing there watching on TV and the lights flickered in the building. About that time we heard the engines roar and uh, we took off out of the building as we were coming out from the office out through the building. The uh, ground shook and we heard, uh, you know, big boom. Looked over and saw the big ball fire. Flegel later told other people about the lights flickering. I was in Atlanta and uh, I was sitting there talking to another guy and and I was explaining to him about whenever we were standing in the office and the lights flickered and everything. And as soon as he heard me say that, he immediately stopped me and he said, well, I'm retired from the Air Force. He said, that plane was shot down. And I said, why? And he said, because whenever the lights flickered, they zap the radar frequency on everything before they shoot. The mayor of Indian Lake also remembers the power going off just before the crash. Our power had gone off and then we felt a tremor. Uh, it sounded like a missile came across our house. I mean, they, they were going that fast. The mayor of Shanksville, Ernie Stuhl, had something interesting to say. I know of two people, I will not mention names, that heard a missile, Stuhl said. They both live very close, within a couple of hundred yards. This one fellow served in Vietnam, and he says he's heard them, and he heard one that day. But who could have possibly shot the plane down? As far as we know, there are no witnesses who saw fighter jets near Flight 93 at the time of the crash. 
There are, however, some witnesses who saw a small, unmarked white plane which flew over the area just before the crash. I was just driving along here, it was a beautiful day, had my window open, had the stereo on, and uh, when I got up here almost to the stop sign, this small white plane at the time, that's what I thought it was, went over top of me. It was so smooth and it just glided right over me, just like that. And then I ducked and when I looked up again, then it just banked to the right and went over and went down behind those trees. Something caught my eye and here was a white plane and it was coming from the crash site area. The debunkers maintain that there is no mystery behind the white plane. It was a corporate jet, they say, which air traffic controllers had asked to take a look on the ground after they realized they had lost Flight 93. There was, in fact, a little white jet that was seen in the area after Flight 93 crashed. A number of witnesses saw it. It was a little DeSalt Falcon corporate jet that was flying to a nearby airport. And what happened is once air traffic control knew they had lost Flight 93, they asked the nearest aircraft to go over the area and actually radio back exact coordinates for the crash site. No. Susan McElwain, however, remembers seeing the white plane before the crash, not after. About 11.30 that night, the FBI came, wanted to talk to me. Um, they kept asking me how big the plane was. I said the plane, you know, it was small, wasn't much bigger than my van that I saw, and, and that it went over top of me. And I said, you want to make sure maybe it was ours and not somebody else's. And then that's when he, he did seem to get a little nicer. Told me that it was um, a white Learjet, someone was taking pictures. I said, before the crash? And he says, well, we gotta go. John Flegel also saw the mysterious plane. Since Flegel arrived on the spot within a minute from the crash, the corporate jet sent by the air traffic controllers would not have had time to descend over the area yet, while the mystery plane was already getting away from the spot into the blue sky. We got there, like I said, probably within within 45 seconds or a minute of impact, we were that we were there. We were there before any firemen, any paramedics, or anybody. We were on site. When we got there, there was a plane flying up above, and he was smart. He flew straight for the sun, so you couldn't you couldn't look at it and see exactly what type of plane or if it was a fighter or what it was. But you know, we caught a glimpse of it, and as he was swinging, he was basically traveling in the same direction as the plane. If the plane was actually shot down. One big question arises. What are we to make of the heroic gesture by the passengers who chose to force the plane to the ground, we are told, in order to save the lives of other fellow countrymen? In truth, this heroic gesture by the passengers has been refuted by the 9-11 Commission itself. It was the hijackers wrote the commission, and not the passengers who chose to intentionally crash the plane in Shanksville. The passengers never even made it into the cockpit. From the final report, we read, at 9.57, the passenger assault began. But for more than five minutes, writes the commission, the passengers were unable to break into the cockpit. After a while, as the outside attack continued, Gerard asked, is that it? Shall we finish it off? A hijacker responded, no, not yet. When they all come, we finish it off. It should be noted that this dialogue was allegedly extracted from the cockpit voice recorder of Flight 93, but the actual recording, as we have said before, was never played in public. At 10.02, a hijacker said, pull it down, pull it down. The hijackers remained at the controls, but must have judged that the passengers were only seconds from overcoming them. The airplane headed down, the control wheel was turned hard to the right. The airplane rolled onto its back, and one of the hijackers began shouting, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. With the sound of the passenger counterattack continuing, the aircraft plowed into an empty field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania at 580 miles per hour about 20 minutes flight time from Washington, D.C. Gerard's objective, concludes the commission, was to crash the airliner into symbols of the American Republic, the Capitol, or the White House. Question, given that they were only 20 minutes away from Washington, and for almost six minutes the passengers had been unable to enter the cockpit, why didn't the hijackers continue flying towards the Capitol? And even if they thought they couldn't make it to Washington, why didn't they try to crash the plane onto a small town nearby? Why crash the plane in an empty field where they knew they could not kill any more victims than those that were already on the plane with them? Maybe a less fictional explanation for Flight 93 is the one offered by Vernon Gross, author and former NTSB investigator. The role the government plays in times of stress, how they view the public. Can the public stand the truth? 
or shouldn't we uh, we need a, uh, a legend at this point we need a really neat story of, of reacting against such a dastardly act as was happening so it's really nice and convenient to think of the Beamer story let's roll and that becomes just like uh, the Alamo and it's just one of those legends and I I think there'll be a lot of pressure to um, let the legend stay where it is. If we now summarize Flight 93, we have no proof whatsoever that the terrorists boarded the plane, nor that they were ever in the cockpit. An alleged hijacker who could not have flown an airliner in the way that Flight 93 was flown. A false concurrent hijacking that called the attention away from the real one. No proof whatsoever that Flight 93 crashed in the field near Shanksville an extended debris field which flatly disproves the official version of the crash and suggests that the plane broke up in mid-air instead, an unexplained small white jet leaving the area right after the impact, and the fact that the passengers who called from their cell phones could not have been on that plane to begin with, which strongly suggests their revolt was a scripted, fictional event intended to fuel a prefabricated legend. Americans, the destruction of the Twin Towers will remain embedded in their memories and their hearts as the epitome of horror, astonishment, and unjustified human suffering. But for some, it may have represented the moment where large corporate interests of global reach and cynical economic greed found the perfect place for a secret encounter. Common wisdom has it that the September 11 attacks destroyed two of the best jewels America has ever had. But exactly jewels, the Twin Towers, were not. While they sat on some of the most valuable real estate in the world, after 30 years the Twin Towers had become obsolete. With each of the floors built as an open space of almost one acre in size, the rising cost of energy had made it extremely expensive to keep the buildings warm in winter and cool in summer. General maintenance was also very expensive compared to buildings from more recent years. In his 1999 book on the Twin Towers, Divided We Stand, author Eric Darton wrote, when the World Trade Center was bombed in February 1993, it was already passing its prime as office space, overtaken by a generation of more recent, cybernetically smart buildings with higher ceilings and greater built-in electrical capacity. To maintain the Trade Center as Class A office space commanding top rents, the Port Authority would have had to spend $800 million rebuilding its electrical, electronic communications, and cooling systems. 
Furthermore, after the 1993 bombing, the tendency had dropped dramatically and it had been very hard to bring it back to normal levels. But the biggest problem with the Twin Towers was the large amount of asbestos they contained. Built in a time when the use of asbestos was still allowed in civil construction, at least 400 tons of this extremely dangerous material had been used to fireproof the steel structure of the buildings and to insulate hundreds of miles of pipings for water, heating, and air conditioning. Asbestos was also present in the ceiling panels, the elevator shafts, and the vinyl tiles from office floors. From a property condition assessment of the Twin Towers dated December 2000, we read, According to Port Authority records, a total of 7 million square feet of vinyl asbestos floor tiles were installed in the World Trade Center. By the time asbestos was banned from civil construction, the Twin Towers were nearing their completion. Initially, the asbestos was encapsulated wherever possible to prevent the particles from being inhaled. But in the 1990s, the regulations grew tighter, and every time a simple renovation was needed, the complete removal and replacement of the asbestos was also required. At the same time, because of the health risk it posed, the cost of asbestos removal and abatement had been skyrocketing. Safety procedures required the areas to be treated to be vacated in advance, hermetically sealed, and kept under negative pressure at all times to prevent particles from escaping outside. Only specialized workers could access the area, wearing airtight suits and respirators. A full decontamination process was required every time they left the area. In the mid-90s, the Port Authority put out different bids for the removal and replacement of the asbestos in a case-by-case -case scenario. For example, this is a 1995 contract for the installation of two low-voltage substations in Towers 1 and 2. One section in the contract listed the replacement of asbestos at floors 41, 42, 75, and 76 in Tower 1 and floors 75 and 76 in Tower 2. Total cost for the asbestos removal and replacement? $868,000. Tower 2, 40th floor. Contract for asbestos removal and abatement? Total cost, $650,000. Towers 1 and 2, removal of asbestos and new ceilings at floors 7, 41, and 75. Total cost, $882,000. It soon became clear that the Twin Towers were quickly turning from a prestigious asset into a serious liability. From the December 2000 condition assessment, we read, from 1986 to 1999, a total 31 contracts were bid, and a total of $58.2 million was spent in abatement projects. By then, 3.5 million square feet of vinyl asbestos floor tile was removed. Only half of the initial 7 million square feet installed. At the estimated cost of $5 to $6 per square foot, that accounted for an additional $20 million in cost for the Port Authority, and that was for the floor tiles only. There were also hundreds of thousands of square feet of spray-on fireproofing to be removed throughout both buildings. And then there were the elevators. This is the list of elevator shafts with asbestos-containing material as of December 2000. This is Tower 1. And this is Tower 2. Reportedly, by the year 2000, the Port Authority was looking at an asbestos abatement bill of as much as $1 billion the same money it would have cost to build a brand new tower. Back in the 90s, the Port Authority had sued the insurance companies, trying to get them to cover the cost of the asbestos removal. But in May 2001, four months before the terrorist attack, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey lost their 10-year-old court battle. At that point, the Port Authority was between a rock and a hard place. The Twin Towers could no longer be maintained without incurring the cost of asbestos removal, yet they could not be demolished because of the large amounts of asbestos they contained. The only remaining option was to dismantle and remove the two poison-filled giants one piece at a time. But the cost of such an operation would have been so astronomical that no one has ever tried to put a number on it. Luckily for all, the stalemate was broken when a real estate tycoon named Larry Silverstein, who already owned Building 7, offered to purchase a 99-year lease for the Twin Towers. 76 years old, and look at him go. He walks fast, talks fast, and is always, always selling. Silverstein seemed in a big hurry to close the deal. 
Even though he had been hospitalized for a car accident during the bidding operations, he asked his doctors to take him off the morphine so the deal could be finalized. So I told the doctor, I said, kill the morphine, and I gotta got get my people in here, because you can't think with morphine. So they let the morphine run down, the pain was terrible, and but I brought everybody together, and that's when we famed our our best and final bid. On July 24th, 2001, Larry Silverstein celebrated the acquisition of the Twin Towers with a public ceremony. Silverstein signed the lease on the World Trade Center just six weeks before 9-11. He then took out an insurance policy covering the Twin Towers for $3.2 billion in case of total destruction. Silverstein then began spending every morning of the week in his new office in the North Tower. And so my mornings were spent at the Trade Center. And then by noon, I was back uptown. But on September 11, luckily for him, Silverstein didn't go to work. Even though he had already scheduled a business meeting in the North Tower, he found out that his wife had made an appointment for him at the dermatologist. The morning of September 11th, Silverstein was scheduled to have breakfast at the restaurant at the top of the North Tower. He canceled at the last minute at the insistence of his wife, Clara, who wanted him to go see his dermatologist. That particular morning, uh, my wife, God bless her, had made an appointment for me uh, at the doctor. And I said, okay, okay, yes, dear, I'll go. <laughs> Everyone who was in that restaurant that morning perished. And then just minutes later, I uh, received a telephone call to turn on a television set and witnessed this horrendous circumstance. Uh... This is how, on the evening of September 11, Larry Silverstein found himself in control of some 12 million square feet of new office space to be built on some of the most valuable real estate in the world. And since the terrorist attacks had been two separate events, contended Silverstein, the insurance companies would have to pay him $7 billion to rebuild what he has always been calling My Three Towers. I will spend $7 billion on My Three Towers. Eventually, a settlement was reached for $4.5 billion, which was still one-third more than the amount initially insured by Silverstein. And since on September 11, due to the terrorist attacks, Building 7 had also been destroyed, Silverstein received another $800 million to rebuild a skyscraper that had originally cost $400 million. It's a much more beautiful building. It's a glass facade, allows the light to come into the space. The, the views on four sides are phenomenal, and the space looks magnificent. In the meantime, all the asbestos from the Twin Towers has been inhaled by the citizens of downtown Manhattan, and especially by the first responders and volunteers who worked at Ground Zero, who are now being decimated by mesothelioma and other pulmonary diseases. In the debate over the destruction of the World Trade Center, two important organizations have played a major role. One is NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which was officially tasked by the U.S. government to investigate the collapse of the three skyscrapers. In 2005, NIST presented their final report on the collapse of the Twin Towers, and in 2008, the one on Building 7. For the Twin Towers, NIST concluded that they were brought down by the consequences of the impacts and the ensuing fires, while Building 7, according to NIST, was brought down primarily by fire alone. In other words, they fully confirmed the official version by the U.S. government. The other organization to bear weight on the debate has been Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, an association of professionals in civil construction founded in 2006 by San Francisco architect Richard Gage. Architects and Engineers lists over 2,000 experts in structural engineering, science of materials, architectural design, fire protection, science of construction, metallurgy, and even experts in controlled demolitions. Since they've entered the fray, Architects and Engineers has brought to the table a solid amount of scientific information refuting the official explanation by NIST on the collapses and confirming the theory of controlled demolitions instead. At the same time, Architects and Engineers has acted as an unrelenting watchdog for every action taken by NIST, pointing out every single error in their work and even forcing them, in some cases, to make corrections to their reports. I think it's uh, something that we need to clarify and correct in the final version of the report. Okay. The first issue that needs to be clarified is the actual strength and solidity of the Twin Towers, since both the 9-11 Commission and the debunkers have made extensive efforts to depict them as extremely light and fragile buildings. The outside of each tower was covered by a frame of 14-inch wide steel columns. The centers of the steel columns were 40 inches apart. These exterior walls bore the majority of the weight of the building. The interior core of the buildings was a hollow steel shaft 
in which elevators and stairwells were grouped. Le torri di New York invece erano sostenute da un'intelaiatura esterna, da sottili nervature d'acciaio, insomma erano come dei parallelepipedi vuoti. Il World Trade Center era una struttura leggerissima, era la massima espressione del grattacielo leggero, come, come lo chiamano i tecnici. C'è un solo altro edificio che io sappia, che è la, quella che si chiamava un tempo la Sears Tower a Chicago, che usa lo stesso tipo di struttura. Dopo il World Trade Center nessuno l'ha più usata. As we shall see, all these statements are false. Contrary to traditional skyscrapers, where all the support columns are equally spaced, in the Twin Towers, part of the supporting columns had been moved towards the exterior wall, creating a large column-free space available for rental. For this reason, the external structure had literally become a grid of steel columns made with prefabricated blocks that were mounted on site. These are the thin steel nerves mentioned by debunker Alberto Angela, 244 steel columns placed approximately two feet apart, which supported 40% of the weight of the towers. Far from being two empty parallelepipeds, the internal structure was comprised of 47 steel columns, so long and sturdy that a special factory in Japan had to be built in order to assemble them. It was the core structure to support the majority of the weight of the building, 60% of it, and not the external structure. The core structure seen on the left is what the 9-11 Commission has called a hollow steel shaft. This is the same core structure near the base of the tower. The core structure was an actual, extremely robust steel skyscraper built within another skyscraper. The core structure housed the stairs, the elevators, and all other services needed for the functioning of the tower. The inner walls of the core structure were made of simple layers of sheetrock. A long series of steel trusses connected the core structure to the external one and supported the floors. The floors were also prefabricated rectangular pieces covered by a thin layer of concrete. The internal and external structure connected through an umbrella-like structure called a hat truss, which kept together the towers and bound them from above. The idea that this kind of structure is fragile and therefore no longer used after 9-11 is disproven by the new Building 7 built by Larry Silverstein. A strong central structure supports the majority of the weight of the building. Long steel beams support the floors and connect the core structure to the external one, allowing for large column-free space in between, a very similar concept to the one used in the Twin Towers. Most importantly, the debunkers forget to mention that the Twin Towers were built with a structural redundancy of three to five times the weight they were meant to support. This structure was capable of holding three to five times the weight. These buildings are built to handle several times the load above them. So those perimeter columns could handle five times the load above them, and the core columns could handle three times the load above them. In addressing the solidity of the Twin Towers, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology stated that its 244 perimeter columns made it one of the most redundant and one of the most resilient skyscrapers. On the same subject, the architectural firm of Roth & Sons wrote, the building as designed is 16 times stiffer than a conventional structure. The Virendil trusses would be so effective, according to the engineer's calculations, that all the columns on one side of a tower could be cut, as well as the two corners and several columns on the adjacent sides, and the tower would still be strong enough to withstand a 100 mile per hour wind. John Skilling, the structural engineer who designed the Twin Towers, stated, live loads on these perimeter columns can be increased more than 2,000% before failure occurs. In particular, the Twin Towers were designed to sustain the impact of a large airliner traveling at 600 miles per hour and still remain standing. Interviewed in 1993 by the Seattle Times, John Skilling stated, We looked at every possible thing we could think of that could happen to the buildings, even to the extent of an airplane hitting the side. Our analysis indicated the biggest problem would be the fact that all the fuel from the airplane would dump into the building. There would be a horrendous fire, a lot of people would be killed, the building structure would still be there. And it was. After the impacts, both towers remained standing, showing no major effect on their stability. Furthermore, NIST has confirmed that the initial jet fuel fires themselves lasted at most a few minutes. This means that from that moment on, the only available source of fuel for the fires was common office furnishings. And, as we know, regular office fires are not hot enough to affect the stability of a steel structure. No steel frame high-rise building has ever collapsed due to fire. In over 20 years, um, I have not seen, until recently, 
a protected steel structure that has collapsed in a fire. These kinds of designs have performed extraordinarily well over uh, history. In fact, until this occurrence, no building had fallen down because of fire. Furthermore, NIST estimated the combustible fuel loading was somewhat lower than found in prior surveys of office spaces. The number of interior walls, and thus the minimal amount of combustible interior finish and limited bookshelf space account for much of the differences. There was no reason for the towers to collapse at that point. With a structure that had clearly withstood the impacts and with less than average office content to feed the fires, both buildings should have remained standing, allowing for the evacuation and rescue of everyone who had survived the initial impacts and the fires. Instead, both buildings suddenly collapsed from top to bottom, one 56 minutes after the impact, the other as much as one hour and 42 minutes after the impact of the plane. Why? The debate on the collapse of the Twin Towers centers around two major questions. One is what caused the initial collapse of the top section of the building onto the lower part of each tower. The second is what caused the complete destruction of the remaining healthy structure below once the top section had collapsed on it. As far as what initiated the collapse, at first we were told that the heat of the fires had softened and melted the structure of the building. In 2002, NOVA depicted a scenario envisioned by many experts at the time, that the truss connections failed in the extreme heat, causing the floors to fall onto one another, precipitating the collapse. As the steel began to soften and melt, the interior core columns began to give. Then you had this sequential failure that took place where it all pancaked one after the other. In fact, it became known as the pancake theory. Donc ça a donné lieu à la théorie qu'on appelle la théorie du pancake, c'est-à-dire que comme cette partie-là est tombée sur un plancher, ce plancher a cédé, puis en cascade, c'est tous les planchers qui ont cédé qui sont tombés les uns sur les autres. Ça s'appelait c'est ça qu'on appelle la théorie du pancake. But the pancake theory had a major flaw. It forgot to explain why the core structure of the towers collapsed. Furthermore, experts pointed out that jet fuel produces barely half the heat needed to melt steel. It would not have been enough to disconnect the trusses from the external structure. It's not that it melts in a fire. In fact, uh, the fires, normal fires are not hot enough to melt steel. Even if you were, for example, to uh, use an unusual uh, fuel like um, kerosene, you cannot achieve temperatures hot enough to melt steel. At that point, the official explanation backtracked and settled for a more generic weakening of the steel due to the fires. You don't need to melt the steel columns, you just need to start weakening them. What we found is it doesn't take temperatures high enough to melt steel, it just has to heat up the steel so it expands and then softens and weakens the structure until it collapses. In the new explanation, the initial failure was no longer blamed on the rupture of the steel trusses, but on their sagging due to the heat. The trusses stayed connected to the columns even as they sagged from the heat. They pulled on the columns, bowing them inward nearly five feet in some areas, until the columns reached the breaking point. Suddenly the columns snapped and as a result the entire top of the building came down pretty much in free fall because the kinetic energy that was unleashed was just huge. NIST also maintained that the impact of the airplanes widely dislodged the fireproofing from the trusses, hastening the process that eventually caused them to sag. It should be noted that NIST made the dislodgement of the fireproofing a necessary condition for the towers to collapse. The buildings would not have collapsed under the effects of the airplane impact and the fuel, jet fuel ignited multi-floor fires. And it only, the reason it collapsed is because the fireproofing was dislodged. But the theory of the sagging trusses created even more problems than the one before. First of all, there is no proof whatsoever that the fireproofing from the steel had been widely dislodged by the impacts, as NIST has maintained. The steel structure of a skyscraper is elastic, not rigid, and it absorbs the impacts by slowly swaying back and forth, not by vibrating. The building swayed slowly one way toward the Hudson River to the west. And by the time it came back, 
I just jumped up and just had to get out of the elevator. In fact, there are good reasons to believe that the fireproofing from the steel was not dislodged at all, as in the following example. This is James Glanz for the New York Times. When the plane hit the North Tower between the 94th and the 98th floors, Steve McIntyre, an engineer for the American Bureau of Shipping, was reading his email on the 91st floor. The plane hit, and I think he described it as the biggest wham he'd ever heard, but there wasn't much shaking. His email was still there after the impact. He was still staring at a glowing screen. He had a little knick-knack, a piece of slate in the shape of a sailboat, hadn't fallen off his desk. Pictures of his wife and kids just propped up on a bookcase were still upright. Nothing had fallen over. McIntyre was just below the point of impact. If his pictures didn't even fall, why should the spray-on fireproofing have been detached from the steel trusses? Secondly, there's no proof that the temperatures were high enough to seriously weaken the steel in any case, with or without fireproofing. The majority of the jet fuel was burnt up instantly in the big fireball, and it was gone. The fires that were left were office furnishings and carpet and things like that. A lot of things in these kind of buildings have to be fire resistant by nature. It's required by code. In their computer simulation, NIST claims to have observed temperatures beyond 1800 degrees during the fires. But NIST has used their own computational model and they've never published the data from their simulation. When architects and engineers asked to verify the computer model used by NIST, their request was denied. The truth is that NIST itself admitted, in their own report, to have no proof for temperatures high enough to seriously weaken steel. From the NIST report we read, of the more than 170 areas examined on 16 perimeter column panels, only three columns had evidence that the steel reached temperatures above 250 degrees centigrade, or 480 degrees Fahrenheit. Only two core column specimens had sufficient paint remaining to make such an analysis, and the temperatures did not reach 250 degrees centigrade. No conclusive evidence was found to indicate that pre-collapse fires were severe enough to have a significant effect on the microstructure that would have resulted in weakening of the steel structure. In other words, NIST openly admits to have no proof to support their own theory. In conclusion, the known facts are Steel melts at about 2800 degrees Fahrenheit. Softening can begin at about 1100 degrees Fahrenheit. Except for three isolated spots, NIST admits to have found no proof of temperatures beyond 480 degrees Fahrenheit, which is less than half the temperatures needed to seriously weaken steel. On the other hand, there is multiple evidence that the temperatures needed to seriously weaken steel were not reached for a sustained time in the Twin Towers. The first one is that a group of 16 people managed to descend through the area devastated by the impact without obviously being burned alive. One of them is Brian Clark. And when we came to the 78th floor, the, the last layer was standing, but it was cracked. And there were flames licking up the other side of the wall like this. It wasn't a roaring inferno. I, I sensed that the flames were maybe starved for oxygen right there, you know, in the interior. We kept going and we got onto the 74th floor when we got down that far. Normal conditions. The lights were on, fresh air coming up from below. Attivissimo has maintained that these people managed to survive because in that part of the building, the stairwell runs on the side of the tower and not through the center. In truth, stairwell A traverses to the side of the tower on the 82nd floor, but Clark and his colleagues were on the 84th. This means they descended two floors in the center of the tower before crossing over. Furthermore, one of Clark's colleagues went back from the 81st to the 91st floor before descending all the way to the ground. Ron DeFrancesco, who went in the 81st floor with me, he went up to 91, caught up to the people, laying down on the floor, to thinking that there was fresher air at floor level. He made his way back to the stairs. And so I started to run downstairs. And so I ended up on the ground level and I went to walk out. Had there been a temperature of 1100 degrees around the stairwell, nobody would have been able to go through it alive. Secondly, there is a series of thermographic images shot with an infrared camera showing temperatures much lower than those needed to soften steel. 
This is the North Tower, seen from below. It's 9.18, about a half an hour after the impact of the first plane, and the indicated temperatures do not reach the color yellow, which means they don't exceed 100 degrees centigrade or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is the South Tower, some 15 minutes after the impact of the second plane. Here too, the indicated temperatures do not exceed 212 degrees Fahrenheit. But the major problem with the sagging trusses theory is that it doesn't make any sense from a mechanical point of view. Even assuming the temperatures were high enough to make them sag to such an extent, where did these relatively thin trusses find the strength to pull and then break apart a supporting structure much larger and stronger than they were? The phenomenon suggested by NIST is called thermal expansion. If one assumes that the trusses were forced to expand downwards by the vertical structures resisting the push, it means they were weaker than the structure and they would have never found the strength to pull it inwards. If instead the trusses sagged on their own, so weakened by fire to become unable to support their own weight, where would they find the strength to pull and break apart the same structure that had easily supported them when they were strong and healthy? In either case, the idea that the trusses alone would have been able to pull and break apart the external structure makes no sense. As we shall see, the external structure did bow inwards before the towers collapsed, but a much greater force than their own must have been applied to those trusses for them to be able to pull and break apart the structure they were attached to. Question. Can you provide any evidence that the fireproofing from the steel trusses was widely dislodged by the impact of the planes, which NIST has made a necessary condition for the collapses to be caused by fire? Can you provide any evidence that the temperatures in the Twin Towers were high enough and lasted long enough to seriously weaken the steel in the areas where the initial collapses occurred? Can you explain how a sagging truss weakened by heat could pull and eventually break apart the structure it is attached to with no external force being applied to it? If the explanation by NIST on what caused the initial collapse seems seriously flawed, their explanation on what caused the complete destruction of the towers does not exist. Within more than 10,000 pages filled with technical data of relative importance, in a footnote on page 82 of the NIST report we read, the focus of the investigation was on the sequence of events from the instant of aircraft impact to the initiation of collapse for each tower. For brevity of this report, the sequence is referred to as the probable collapse sequence, although it does not actually include the structural behavior of the tower after the conditions for collapse initiation were reached and collapse became inevitable. With the simple word inevitable, NIST purports to have explained the total destruction of 80,000 tons of a perfectly healthy steel structure upon itself. The area below the damage zone where the planes flew in and where the fire was, that area below that, those 80 or 90 stories, 80,000 tons of structural steel was not damaged in any way. Yet you stood there and watched it destroy itself wiping out floor by floor all 287 structural columns as if they didn't exist underneath the uh, damage zone. When a well-known debunking website wrote to NIST asking for a clarification on the sequence of the collapses, it received a similar answer. NIST did not describe the specific sequence of events after global collapse initiated. This astonishing statement has been repeated by NIST over and over again under the most surprising of justifications. Once the collapse initiated, the video evidence is rather clear. It, it was not stopped by the floors below, so there was no calculation that we did uh, to demonstrate that, so what is clear from the videos. This is tantamount to saying, once the Pearl Harbor attack initiated, the video evidence shows that the U.S. fleet was quickly overwhelmed by the Japanese, so we didn't feel the need to find out why it happened. To make up for this embarrassing void, the debunkers often point at some independent studies which purport to explain the collapses by gravity alone. The study most quoted by debunkers is called What Did and Did Not Cause the Collapse of the WTC Twin Towers in New York by Czech engineer Zenik Bazant. But in his own study, Mr. Bazant admits to have worked on a one-dimensional model while he states, the high tilt seen on the South Tower top would call for a three-dimensional model of progressive collapse. In any case, it is not up to private studies to explain the collapse of the Twin Towers. 
NIST received $20 million of taxpayers' money to determine why and how World Trade Center 1 and World Trade Center 2 collapsed following the initial impacts of the aircraft, and to this day, they have not done so. This is why Architects and Engineers has kept pressing NIST, asking them to publish their data in regards to the potential energy released during the downwards movement of the upper stories and the absorptive capacity of the intact structure below the collapsed zone. Structural engineers do this every day. This is not rocket science. You have the known weight of this building mass. You have what are known columns below it in order to resist it. You let it go in your models, and you calculate what the, re what the resistance is. Why didn't they do it? Could it be because they knew darn well that it would not have collapsed at all? In fact, it could be suggested that NIST never explained the collapses by gravity alone because it would be impossible to do so without violating at least two of the most fundamental laws of physics. One is Newton's third law of motion, which states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. This means that two opposing forces will neutralize each other. In a head-on collision, the two cars absorb each other's kinetic energy and transform it into physical deformation or damage. After that, the system comes to a rest as there is no more energy to be dissipated. The top section pushing on the bottom section, it's gonna meet equal forces as it goes. Both sections are going to be uh, demolished at the same rate. So by the time you've crushed up 15 stories below it, the top 15 stories are also going to be crushed. And so there's nothing left now to crush the rest of the building. Something of this kind is what we should have seen when the top section of the towers collapsed onto the lower one. The upper and lower sections should have mutually destroyed each other until all the energy is dissipated and the system comes to a rest. Alternatively, as shown in this experiment with two towers made of snow, the top section could have fallen off to the side after the initial collapse. What could not have happened is this. A little tiny chunk of the building can't possibly fall and crush the entire structure below it. This is such a simple, fundamental concept that architects and engineers were astonished in seeing it totally ignored by NIST. This is high school physics and our whole society is being led to believe that these fundamental laws of physics, hard science, don't apply anymore. But even if we assume that the top section of the tower had enough potential energy to destroy the rest of the structure below, it could not have done so at the speed it did, which was near freefall speed. That would have violated an even more important principle in physics, known as the law of momentum conservation. This law states that the total energy within an isolated system must always remain the same. As we have seen, the energy can be transformed within the system, from motion to physical deformation. But for the deformation to begin, the velocity must decrease in order for one kind of energy to be transformed into the other. No new energy can be added to the system. One particular example of momentum conservation is freefall. Freefall happens when the only force applied on an object is gravity. This means that all the potential energy contained by the object is converted into vertical motion. As soon as the falling object hits an obstacle and breakage occurs, the speed must decrease because some of its energy needs now to be converted into physical breakage. It takes energy to break things apart, and that energy must come from within the system. Thus, the falling rock cannot keep falling at free fall speed and break apart at the same time because it doesn't have enough energy to do both. Let's go now to the Twin Towers and ask a simple question. Assuming that the top section on the left contains enough potential energy to destroy the rest of the tower, and assuming we dropped both upper sections at the same time, which one would hit the ground first? It would be the second, of course. As it finds no obstacles in its path, the section on the right would quickly accelerate to free fall speed and maintain it all the way to the ground. The section on the left instead needs to use some of its energy to destroy the structure below, so it could never achieve free fall speed. In the case of the Twin Towers, however, both upper sections fell with an acceleration close to free fall speed, as if their path had been practically free from obstacles. It took each tower between 10 and 12 seconds to collapse to the ground, while an absolute freefall time would have been 9.2 seconds. 
In other words, both upper sections of the towers found enough energy to destroy 80,000 tons of healthy structure below while accelerating to near free fall speed. This is, as we have said, absolutely impossible by gravity alone. The law of momentum conservation won't allow it. A building cannot do free fall with a huge structural steel structural system in place to support it. Uh, the Twin Towers could, could not have come straight down through the resistance of 80,000 tons of structural steel at the speed of a practically free fall. That just would not happen. If in fact it actually hit and made an impact, it was effectively crushing anything, pushing hard on this core structure below it, the core structure is going to push back equally hard, and that's what's going to cause the top section of the building to slow down. As energy is drained away from the system to deform those members, it would slow down the descending mass and cause a descent at less than free fall speed. There is only one way for those buildings to have collapsed at the speed they did. The buildings fall at a speed uh, which can only occur if the structure has been removed, the vertical structure. The same Shyam Sunder from NIST has acknowledged that free fall can only be achieved with the absence of a structure below. Free fall time would be an object that has no uh, structural components below it. But what could have removed the supporting structure below, since the falling section didn't have any extra energy to do so? The fact that it's coming down at free fall says all of the energy is being used to just make it go straight down which means it's coming down through itself and not breaking up the building as it goes. Something else has to be clearing the way. There is only one known way to allow that kind of acceleration while removing the supporting structure. A building cannot do free fall without it being blown up. That's the only way it could come down at free fall. The only way that a building can accelerate as it collapses is by having pre-engineered, precisely timed and precisely placed explosives, in other words, controlled demolition. Since a near freefall speed automatically means a controlled demolition, the debunkers have tried to deny that the Twin Towers fell in about 10 seconds each. Tempi di crollo, si parla di 10 secondi, tempo di caduta libera, esatto, ma i tempi di crollo delle torri gemelle non sono quelli di una caduta libera, sono sulla base dei video disponibili di almeno 16 secondi. Basta ascoltare la durata del boato. We couldn't count with him, as it's very difficult to establish the exact duration of a collapse by listening to the sounds only. Furthermore, a couple of seconds more or less would not make a big difference, as the time for the transfer of momentum between each collapsing floor must be considered anyway. So a floor impacting on a floor below would transfer momentum, and that floor, those floors transferring would transfer momentum so that such that in the Twin Towers, if you didn't have any columns whatsoever, it would still take a minimum of 30 seconds for these towers to collapse uh, just by transferring the momentum of the floors. In any case, the near freefall speed of about 10 seconds has been confirmed by different official sources. The 9-11 Commission wrote that the South Tower collapsed in 10 seconds. Mr. Sunder from NIST has confirmed similar timings. The measurements have indicated that Tower 1 collapsed in about 11 seconds and Tower 2 collapsed in about 9 seconds. Mr. Sunder has also acknowledged that the towers came down practically at free fall speed. As a result, the entire top of the building came down pretty much in free fall. The same admission is present in the official report. Since the stories below the level of collapse initiation provided little resistance, the building section above came down essentially in free fall. At this point, we can pose the following question. Given that the building section above came down essentially in free fall, given that for free fall to occur, no supporting structure must be present, and given that the falling sections didn't have any extra energy to destroy the structure below, can you suggest anything different from some kind of controlled demolition for the removal of the supporting structure, which was necessary for near freefall speed to be achieved? 
At this point, one may wonder what the response by the debunkers has been to all the scientific arguments presented by architects and engineers. There has been no response. All the debunkers have done is to either belittle this association of professionals or to ignore it altogether. Et pour les ingénieurs, quand vous regardez euh, les ingénieurs qui ont signé, alors là, c'est hallucinant. C'est-à-dire que vous avez des ingénieurs en électricité, en hydraulique, en sûreté nucléaire. Enfin bon, c'est vraiment la, la tour de Babel de l'ingénierie. Les personnes qui sont compétentes en calcul de structure, alors je les ai regardées, une petite trentaine. Petite trentaine, je suis généreux. Whether the experts in structural engineering are 30 or 300, it should not make any difference. It's their arguments that must be refuted, and Kirant has never done so. Atibissimo instead has chosen to belittle architects and engineers as a whole by terming all its members as gymnasium builders. Abbiamo soltanto Richard Cage e i suoi 1200 costruttori di 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 palestre che dicono ma secondo noi. But Atibissimo has never responded to their arguments either. But the most shocking statement comes from popular mechanics. In their book Debunking 9/11 Myths, they wrote not one of the leading conspiracy theorists has a background in engineering, construction, or related fields. This statement appears both in the original publication, dated 2006, and in the revised edition, published in 2011. By then, architects and engineers had been active for almost five years, listed more than 1,300 experts in civil engineering, had made presentations in 20 different countries in the world, and had been invited on national television several times. And what caught my eye is their claim that more than 1,300 architects and engineers examined the evidence about Building 7's collapse and disagree with the official report issued by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. I certainly am much more open minded about it than I was, and it is because of the involvement of the 9-11 families and all these engineers and architects. Clearly, uh, they know more than I do. The truth is that from the moment architects and engineers has entered the fray, not one of their scientific arguments disproving the official version and confirming the theory of controlled demolitions has been refuted in any way by the debunkers or by anyone else.